thank you, everybody. We start uh, now with uh, the last session, and uh, it's the third group of presentations about uh, resources. We have uh, seven papers, so we start uh, immediately. And so the first presentation is uh, the Circe Collection of Linguistic Resources in Clarin It. So please uh, go on, uh, Raquel. Thank you and good afternoon. Yes, I'm Raquel Strugnoli and uh, I'm here to present uh, the collection of linguistic resources uh, for Latin made available by the Stirks Research Center uh, in the Italian repository of Clarin. Um, so uh, TIRX is a, a research center of uh, Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore in Milan, in Italy, uh, founded in 2009 to keep the legacy of a former research group, which was started by Father Roberto Busa at the end of the 70s. Since 2018, our center hosts the ERC project LILA, Linking Latin, whose aim is to build a knowledge base of linguistic resources for Latin according to the principles of a linked data paradigm. Following the footsteps of Father Busa, whose main contribution was the Index Domesticus, that is the corpus collecting the works of Thomas Aquinas, the main research topic of CIRCE is the development of linguistic resources and NLP tools for Latin. Uh, reflecting this main research line, we contributed to Clarin by sharing a set of lexical and textual resources for Latin developed across more than a decade at the center. Uh, among the textual resources, we uh, distribute uh, um, the data set that we created for the evaluation campaign Evalat in 2020, uh, containing texts manually annotated with Pato Speech Tags and Lemmas, and also the index to Mysticus Triben that contains syntactic information. As for the lexical resources, we distribute a collection of lemmas associated with grammatical and morphological information that we call uh, lemma bank, a valency lexicon called Latin vallex, a prior polarity sentiment lexicon called Latin affectus, uh, a list of Latin loans from ancient Greek, a collection of Proto-Italic and Proto-Indo-European reconstructed forms, and last but not least, a database of Latin derivation and morphology called uh, Word Formation Latin. All the resources are made available through the ILC for Clarin data center in a dedicated repository uh, and the Clarin Virtual Language Observatory. By combining uh, the resources that I just uh, briefly presented, it is possible for the users of Clarin uh, to gather various types of information um, concerning Latin lemmas and also see their context of use in the uh, corpora. Uh, so let's take, for example, the lemma dignus, meaning worthy. So uh, next, the Lila uh, Lemma Bank reports that Dignus is a first class adjective with a positive degree, so it's not a superlative or a comparative. Uh, in, and it also share, it also belong to the same word formation family of other lemmas, such as the verb Digno. Uh, then we have the derivational morphology database that describes how other lemmas are derived from uh, Dignus. So for example, uh, um, in, in Dignus uh, is made by adding the, the uh, prefix in and in Dignitas by also adding a suffix tas and per Indignus by adding a prefix per. Uh, then we have uh, Latin uh, vallex. So in Latin vallex, we see that uh, um, the relation between digna, dignus and its complement. So in this case, uh, we see that uh, dignus as uh, a one frame entry uh, and uh, one complement uh, having the role of patent, uh, the function path. And we see also an example of use. Dignus is also uh, in, an entry of Latin affectus uh, with a strong positive polarities, plus one. And uh, Dignus uh, is uh, a lemma that is present also in the Index Domesticus Tribank, uh, and it will be uh, 36 times is present in the corpus, and uh, you, show, you see an example in this sentence. 
Uh, I now conclude uh, just mentioning uh, uh, in the following slide that we have uh, two forthcoming uh, resources. One is the extended version of the depolarity lexicon, Latin Aspectus, and the other resource that we are, mm, are going to uh, add to Clarin is the annotated corpus of Dante Alighieri's Latin works uh, annotated with the part of speech, lemma, and uh, syntax. Thanks. Thank you. And then uh, we go to the next paper. It's uh, the Cretan Institutionalist Inscriptions meets Clarin E.T. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mirena Vadonakis, and I thank the organizer for being able to be here. And I start by uh, introducing the resource Cretan Institutional Inscriptions. Uh, so uh, this resource uh, was created in the context of my uh, PhD project uh, in Greek uh, epigraphy uh, carried out at the University of Venice. And the goal of the project was that to analyze the Cretan institutions from 7th to 1st century BC, and in particular to highlight the local diverse diversity in the institutional frameworks as uh, it is testified by the uh, richly varied epigraphic records that we have. And in order to achieve this, the work involved first the collection and edition of, of all the 600 scattered inscriptions relevant to this, and then the following al analysis of each institutional element and framework in Crete. And this led finally to the creation of the digital epigraphic resource, uh, Cretan Institutional Inscriptions, uh, which includes uh, uh, the epigraphic collection in XML TI uh, epidoc of the inscriptions, and also to XML TI catalogs of Cretan political entities and institutions. Next slide, please. And so um, regarding the applied uh, methodologies, uh, this resource follows uh, some well-established practices in digital epigraphy, and especially the use of the epidoc substandard of TIXML, which in this case has been used in a way that was functional to address the specific research uh, questions, and in particular with regards to uh, the markup of the institutional elements such as uh, officials, boards, assemblies, and so on. And also, as it is common in digital epigraphy, all the contents have been uh, made available in open access under a Creative Commons license. Uh, what is new, on the other hand, is the use of an open source tool, Epidoc Frontend Services, FS, uh, which uh, have the great benefit of facilitating uh, consistently the creation of the epigraphic digital resource, uh, even without any IT support. And in particular, it provided the facility to perform lemmatized searches and to create with, with some XSLT adaptation, uh, specific thematic uh, search filters, and also to have uh, some complex indexes displaying, uh, being displayed as the synoptic tables uh, with an aggregation of different data derived from um, or XML elements and attributes. Uh, next slide, please. And considering now uh, how this resource is connected to the VDPH and Clarinet, uh, so as the PhD was carried out at the University of Venice, it could benefit for its publication for, from the support of the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities. And uh, in addition to, the, to this, the project would also benefit from the collaboration between the VDPH and the Institute for Computational Linguistic of the Italian uh, National Research Council and uh, the Italian Node of Clarin Clarinet, which led uh, to the publication of the resource uh, this year. And on one hand, the involvement, the involvement of Clarinet uh, provided the transmission of the know-how and the necessary technological infrastructure to the VDPH. On the other hand, uh, its publication of the resource uh, promoted the opening up of uh, uh, clarity to new digital classics areas, uh, such as digital epigraphy, and also the increase of ancient Greek resources uh, that are accessible via the Clarion Virtual Language Observatory. Uh, next slide, slide please. And uh, turning now uh, to see how the resource is concretely organized. So the union of the uh, XML dataset and the code of the customized FS software were originally stored in a GitHub repository uh, for versioning purposes. So the complete resource, uh, that is the entire searchable web application is hosted uh, on a server of the uh, ILC for Clarin B Center, uh, whereas the dataset has also been stored on a Clarinet server uh, where there are also this, a description of the uh, world project and of the web application. 
Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, uh, another technical aspect that is worth mentioning is the dockerization of the resource. So following a well, um, a well established uh, practice of using DevOps methodologies uh, promoted by Clarinet, uh, in order to enhance uh, its portability, uh, the web application components have been divided in containers by creating a Docker image, uh, which uh, was then pushed to Docker Hub uh, registry and then deployed through uh, the Rancher environment. So with this, uh, I'll leave you uh, some links and I conclude my presentation and I thank you for your you for listening. Thank you a lot. And we go to the next presentation, Heist Taboo, a database of contextually inappropriate words for Icelandic. Please, uh, Agnes. Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, Ice Taboo is a database of contextually inappropriate words in Icelandic, uh, which we at the Language and Technology Lab at the University of Iceland have been working on. Uh, the goal was to collect words that are inappropriate or offensive in some contexts and create an annotated database which could be used for multiple purposes in language technology solutions. We began by collecting words manually, mainly through brainstorming sessions at the lab and by proposing and by browsing social media. Yeah. But later on, we went through similar lists from other resources that were developed for other purposes, mostly for not exposing children to certain types of subjects. We also systematically searched for words containing certain word parts, uh, which are generally considered inappropriate or offensive. We would like to clarify that the list does not contain any actual information or data on the real opinion of the public towards these words. They are merely thought to elicit a negative reaction for some speakers in some context. The scale of inappropriateness is of course subjective and can therefore be different for different people. However, we believe the database can be used as a basis to facilitate further development of such data. Each word was classified and marked depending on the reason it can trigger a negative reaction in some contexts, along with other information. The result is this database, a list of 2,725 entries published on Claren. And yes, on this slide, you can see the main classes into which uh, the taboo words were classified. And as you can see, they are somewhat different as some words are classified by meaning, for example, the offensive profession names and offensive disability words. Uh, some are classified by word category, like nasty adjectives and verbs of inappropriate actions, and others by usage, like swear words. Uh, these categories were not decided beforehand, but rather emerged throughout the process of collecting the data. Uh, yes, in addition to these classes, we also have to annotate words that have a nuanced relationship with offensiveness. Some words are not necessarily considered taboo or offensive, but contain some sort of loaded meaning, and therefore it would be better to exclude them from texts in certain situations, uh, like texts meant for children and so on. Uh, we decided to keep these classes separate from the other taboo words. So uh, here we have an example of a taboo word entry. Uh, this is the Icelandic word fostra, which roughly means daycare babysitter. The word was used for a long time for preschool teachers, but is now considered an obsolete and degrading term for the profession because it indicates that they are not a profession of educators. Uh, and you can see how we annotate each word in the database. Uh, the entry contains the word itself, fostra, its part of speech, noun, a code that represents its classification, in this case, a uh, profession name, and possibly a second code for a secondary classification. We also include the meaning of the word and the reason it might be considered offensive in some contexts. Uh, an extra field is provided for additional comments, and we also have information about any alternative non-offensive meaning that the word may have. Uh, yes, in conclusion, we have created a database on contextually inappropriate words for Icelandic. It has already been published on Clarin and is available under a CC by 4.0 license. Uh, it's already being used in a language correction software, uh, which was developed in partnership with a software company. Uh, interest interestingly, recently, an online newspaper, Kartnin, has recently started using that software for their articles and other media. This means our database was in some part implemented in correcting their material for
for example, their coverage of last weekend's elections. So although this is a small project, it can serve as a good basis for further development. Uh, okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. The next uh, paper is uh, the nature of Islamic as a second language, an insight from the learner error corpus for Icelandic. And uh, yes, hello. Um, hello, everyone. So I will be presenting the Learner Error Corpus for Icelandic, developed also at the Language Technology Lab at the University of Iceland. You can just move on to the... Uh, we can. This is just the structure of the paper. Just Let's just move on to the background. So I will not dwell much on the background of analyzing Icelandic as a learner language now. But uh, one thing we have to keep in mind is that the interest in learning Icelandic as a second language and research about it is rather novel, actually, as immigration in Iceland only truly started at the turn of the century, but now the first and second generation immigrants uh, account for 15% of the population. So it has become very significant in the public discourse. And this corpus is the first of its kind, and we hope that it will shed some light on the process of learning Icelandic as a second language. Uh, it is part of a larger project for developing error corpora for Icelandic, which was presented here earlier by Thorun. And it is still in development, so we have only had 70 text entries so far with the mean of uh, mean, mean uh, word number of uh, 1,780, but a statistically significant number of errors. So I will not talk much about the methodology of creating the corpus per se, because it was also covered earlier today. Uh, it was the, sorry, you, you've skipped uh, a bit too quickly. But, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so about the text collection, just uh, I wanted to say that we had a public online uh, content, uh, uh, submission form and the texts were previously unpublished and uh, uncorrected texts uh, that were mostly uh, collected from the authors themselves, uh, from the BA students of Icelandic as a second language at the University of Iceland. And um, Yes, so the annotation system and the error codes were created originally for the Icelandic error corpus, but it was extended uh, with error codes that only appear in L2. And the text include metadata with their authors first and other languages, length of residence in Iceland, length of study of Icelandic, and their proficiency level on the CEFR scale. So now next slide. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so we did uh, two types of contrastive interlanguage analysis, first comparing the L2 data with the Icelandic error corpus, and it was immediately spotted that there is significant dif dif uh, difference in both the number and the type of errors between the corpora. So you can see that uh, the error instances for L2 are you know, three times as much as in the L1 corpus, and also, for example, the grammar use related errors uh, comprise, uh, account for almost 50% of all the errors for L2, but only 12 for L1. And there are 35 error codes that only appear in the L2 corpus, uh, most of them within the grammar category. Next slide, please. Uh, so, yes, we also the, compared the rankings of different error codes for both corpora to see uh, where the biggest similarities and differences lie. And as I said, like the lowest ranking for L1 are clearly the errors which have zero frequency. So this is mostly where the delta rank is the highest. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also did an analysis um, of the corpus within itself uh, based on the feature of uh, skill level and length of residence. And maybe we can move on to the next one. This is uh, the visual representation of the results, of the first results. So we can see that the uh, error instances decrease with the skill level, which was expected. And the thickness of the lines represents the number of words within each uh, level. Uh, obviously, the A1, uh, the A1 texts are the shortest. So we've got the fewest words, where the C2 are mostly master theses. And we noticed some very you know, known stagnation points, like between levels B1 and B2, there is uh, even uh, some error codes, instances, instances of some error codes increase rather than decrease. And as for length of residence, it is mostly intertwined with the skill level. So it also drops steadily, but you know, even for people who have been in Iceland for more than six years and have studied Icelandic at the university, the error instances, instances in the written output are still twice as much as for uh, the L1 corpus. Uh, next slide. Uh, so yes, to sum up, this corpus is still in development. It has been published on Clarin in its current form, 
and we are hoping to uh, conduct further data analysis based on other features, both demographic and linguistic, such as the ages of the authors and their first languages to see if it has any kind of uh, uh, effect on the output. And yes, I believe that's all I have I had time for. So yeah, uh, for further questions, we'll discuss in the q and Thank you. Thank you a lot. And uh, the next paper uh, presentation is Swedish Word Matrix, a Swiss uh, Clarin resource for psycholinguistic research in the Swedish, Swedish language. This is Eric Witt. Please. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes. So this paper is written by uh, me, myself, Eric Witte, Jens Edlund, Arne Jönsson, and Henrik Danielsson. Uh, and next slide, please. Whenever you read a written word, or hear a spoken word, the visual information from your eyes and the auditory information from your ears is processed along with the contextual information in multiple relay stations within your brain in order to find a match in what is called your mental lexicon. In the mental lexicon, the meanings of all the words you have learned are stored. Accessing the mental lexicon is therefore necessary in order to understand the word you hear or read. And this process needs to be fast uh, because uh, words come rapidly in speech and written uh, texts. Next slide, please. The speed of lexical access can be measured in so-called lexical decision tasks. A typical lexical decision task presents two words. One is a real word and the other is not. And the task is to decide as quickly as possible which is the real word. In order to do that, the participant, participant must be able to match the presented real word to an entry in his or her mental lexicon. The time it takes for the participant to respond therefore reflects the time it takes to find the particular word in the mental lexicon. Next slide, please. When psycholinguists compare such response times between different words, they typically, typically find that words that are common in the language are identified faster than less common words. This word frequency effect is well known. Perhaps less known is the neighborhood density effect. In the terminology of the so-called neighborhood activation model, phonologically similar words are referred to as phonological neighbors. Apparently, such words compete within the mental lexicon, with the result that words in dense phonological neighborhoods take longer to identify. Another factor influencing the speed of lexical access is phonotactic probability. Instead of the traditional binary distinction between legal and illegal speech sound combination, probabilistic phonotactics goes a bit further and concerns the probability of occurrence of different legal phonotactic combinations. Psycholinguistic evidence suggests that with higher phonotactic probability, words are identified faster. The last factor I was going to mention is, or, no, you can go, yeah, is orthographic transparency. Um, that, that's one, yeah. Uh, studies have shown that words with a high level of consistency between spelling and phonemic content are not only easier to read, but also to perceive auditorily. The research on the influence of these factors on human speech perception has been based primarily on the, on the English language, and in the Swedish context, not much research has been done in, in this area. Uh, one reason for this has been the relative lack of availability of psycholinguistic metrics uh, which are needed for such studies. In 2019, however, the lexical database called the AFC list, containing around 800,000 Swedish words, all supplied with spellings, phonetic transcriptions, and frequency of occurrence was published. Based on this data, Witte and Köbler uh, who also published the AFC list, developed algorithms to calculate many different psycholinguistic met metrics, including the ones uh, mentioned here. Uh, now you can skip the next slide, please. Uh, so in the current study, we have implemented these algorithms uh, in a multi-platform software library called Swedish Word Metric Calculations uh, and in a, into an in internet uh, web 
uh, internet uh, <laughs> interface uh, called uh, Swedish Word Metrics. Uh, and both will be available through the uh, Speech Language Bank of Sweden. On the Swedish Word Metrics website, uh, researchers can easily calculate all the psycholinguistic metrics mentioned here for any Swedish word or non word. Uh, the website isn't quite up and running yet, but uh, in its intended location, but a fully functioning preview uh, is available at SwedishWordMetrics.com. Uh, next slide, please. So to summarize, uh, this study provide data related to how easy Swedish words are to perceive, their likelihood of confusion, how well they correspond to typical phonotactic patterns of, Swedish, of the Swedish language, and how easily spelled they are. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. And we go to the next presentation. Insights uh, on the Swedish COVID-19 corpus, uh, and it is Dimitrias presenting. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and so in this presentation, I will briefly say a few words about the creation of a rather small, but compared to Giga Corpora on the same domain for other languages, but very targeted corpus, and that is the Swedish COVID-19 corpus. I will briefly introduce you to the motivation for the creation of the corpus, some, some notes on its content and format, and also other details, such as how to access and even download the corpus. And I will also present a smergosport of some preliminary use cases analysis that can be made with the, this material. So yes, uh, so why such a corpus? So at uh, some point for nearly a year, um, a year, a year ago, and to the best of our knowledge, we realized that there was no uh, such uh, corpus available for Swedish. So while the researchers around the world were already doing a lot of work on linguistic and textual aspects of, of the pandemic. So therefore we decided to, to, uh, to offer the possibility and start collecting uh, relevant textual data, data on the coronavirus. The corpus was uh, automatically sampled from a dedicated website uh, on the internet with corona with related information. And, uh, and um, since uh, I do my work at the uh, uh, Swedish Language Bank at uh, the Spoke Back and Text, then uh, the, at the Department of Swedish, uh, which is also a, a Clarion certified B Center. So we decided that we were the most suitable place to, to collect, label, develop, store, and even explore this, uh, this material in very different ways. Uh, the advantages is that we see with such a data set is, of course, that we can support our own, but also other researchers' language related activities, whether these are quantitative or qualitative, and also support research on COVID-19 from different angles. And the corpus uh, at this point is about uh, over 6,000 articles from var various sources, as I said, and um, the content is harmonized and then uh, cleansed from uh, boilerplate and duplicate content, so, so um, in the same format. And, uh, and the corpus is also download downloadable from the SPX uh, site, as you see the, the links at the bottom of this page, and also accessible to search in various ways from the uh, interface core. Um, so uh, we have enriched the corpus with a small number of metadata, including a, a zone label to its article. And the, the metadata is basically the title, the URL source, the publication date, and uh, the article authorship, if that was available. Uh, there are very, various means to explore the corpus using, for instance, the, the corp tool uh, at the bottom left in this page is a picture of that. And, and uh, some possible uh, deeper investigations that can be done will be on the, can, could be done on the vocabulary, like compound analysis or idioms or metaphors in the corpus, or explore different kinds of um, semantic dimensions, like the attitudes uh, towards certain uh, people like the elderly or um, sentiment on vaccination, for example, or look at discourse phenomena and uh, look at different uh, micro and macro events that emerge in the corpus. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, in the next slide, <laughs> uh, there are some, some views of the many explorations that can be done in this corpus and how to visualize it uh, both in core but also in other available tools, tools like OYANT, for instance. Uh, so on the left part is just different, uh, try to track different uh, frequency using uh, spikes and surges of the corona related vocabulary, for example, how uh, trend line, using trend lines, for example, to see the frequency distribution of the coronavirus or COVID-19 words in the corpus or in the third box on the left, you can see, for example, the alarming trend of vaccine skepticism, which raises rapidly around the uh, beginning of this year when uh, 
vaccination period started and now uh, after summer and at the fourth we can um, study how different uh, compound words in Swedish uh, emerge uh, pop up in the document in the middle uh, we can uh, there's a few pictures on uh, name entities and terminology recognition um, and uh, although um, word clouds is not the optimal way to for scientific purposes they still give some good uh, quick visual overview of uh, frequent uh, uh, set of entities. So on the top it's uh, organization names in the domain of, uh, of media and news. In the middle it's, uh, is the symptoms. And in the, the last one, the third is um, personal names, for example. And to the left is just, again, uh, just a snapshot of, of uh, uh, frequent bigrams and how they can be visual visualized in different ways. Like for example, using terms very in Voyant or, or other tools. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we can explore uh, the corpus in other ways as well, more, more advanced, so to speak. So, um, for example, we have used topic modeling um, to, to this corpus to try to identify topics and, and uh, generate words related to these topics. And uh, we can investigate how topics within documents are distributed according to the model generated. So these are the... the, the uh, uh, word clouds on, uh, on the top of the, of the right part of this page. And also sentiment analysis using available resources from Sprogback and text, for example. So there are a lot, uh, there are a couple of uh, available sentiment lexicons that can be used uh, to, to try and, um, and, uh, and uh, classify the polarity of, of, uh, of sentences or texts or documents or even words. Uh, for, for example, these examples that I have uh, here in this slide and measure uh, for each word, for example, um, which uh, sentiments is a positive, negative, or neutral. And next slide, the last one. So summarizing, um, we have created a Swedish timestamp time data set uh, with Corona COVID-19 uh, related content annotated with some basic metadata. The data set is searchable and downloadable from the uh, SPX website. The content can be applied for various micro and macro linguistic explorations. And I have illustrated a couple of uh, examples like topic modeling and sentiment analysis. Uh, so far it has been used for a few projects like uh, neologism detection and compound exploration and also anti-vaccination rhetoric work. And for the future, we will we'll like to do some deeper analysis on the different levels of linguistic analysis and um, further develop and enrich uh, the material with other types of related content like uh, social media that we have already sampled, but it's not at this point uh, part of the COVID-19 yet. Thank you. Thank you a lot. And then we go to the last presentation uh, is Voices from Ravensbrück towards the creation of an oral and multilingual resource family. Thank you, Sylvia. Good afternoon. I'm glad to present the project also on behalf of my colleagues. You can see here the names and all the institutions involved here in the slide. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Voices from Ravensbrück aim at introducing a new type of corpus in the Clarion Resource Family Tree, that is narratives covering oral history interviews and other types of spoken narrative discourse in both a audio and textual form. Interviews, aside from oral history, are, are a central object of research in a broad variety of fields. And we firmly believe that there is still a lot of room for comparison and cross-fertilization between these disciplines, uh, oral history, linguists, uh, uh, education, and so on, uh, starting exactly from oral archives of the past. Other futures make interviews interesting. First, they are co-created and mediated through the use of language, speech, and memory. In addition, they can be appreciated in a multimodal way. You can see the interview, you can hear the record, you can read the transcript. And finally, they reveal the creation of identity with respect to the social, the economical, the political, and the cultural context. We start working together as a research group in 2016 in the domain of oral archives, and we made several workshops under the Clarion umbrella. We learned that one of the risks of the oral history is its uniqueness. Each interview is a word in itself. Other word sayings, our biggest challenge was trying to reduce the abundance of variables to a set of parameters that make a comparison between different oral history projects meaningful within a particular paradigm. 
Next slide, please. With the donation of the archive of the Italian scholar Anna Maria Bruzzone, a new opportunity for cross-disciplinarity uh, and multilingual research presented itself. Anna Maria Bruzzone, together with Lydia Beccaria Rolfi, interviewed five survivors from Ravensbrück uh, camp for her book, first published in 1917 and then in 2020. Interviews about experience in one camp present a specific set of variables. What, are, what all narratives about being imprisoned in Ravensbrück have in common is their gender perspective. What makes the, device, the diversity of the narratives interesting is the social con, cultural context in which the retrospective account is expressed. Moreover, the spoken memoir of this woman have been collected extensively in many of the 20 countries to which the woman returned at the end of the war. And this made comparisons across languages and diverse historical contexts more viable. Uh, next slide, please. In this year, we digitized the Italian interviews and we are now in the process of transcribing and curating them. The first action was supported by Siena University and the second by Clarin Foundy. The third task that we are now pursuing can be summarized as follows. Next slide, please. To complement the Italian interviews with English, Dutch, and German ones. In the long run, we also intend to expand the project to Eastern Europe, especially to Poland and Russia, where many survivors came from. In this map, you can see where we succeeded in locating various oral archives from Ravensbrück experience. Many other flags have to be planted also with the help of the Clarin community, and we will face together the challenges involved in such work collecting data from different contexts of creation, looking for a common denominator among the high diversity of artifacts, public oral history archive, private oral history archives, the diversity of metadata involved, the diversity of legal framework involved. So many thanks for your attention and please contact us in case you find an oral interview from Ravis Group. Thank you. Thank you to all speakers, so also for keeping at the time. Uh, I will uh, just look first in the chat. First of all, uh, the general uh, impression of all these papers are very so diverse that uh, indicate the diversity of resources that we have in Clarin, going from uh, uh, Cretan uh, manuscript to COVID-19 uh, and the speech uh, and uh, text and lexica and so on. So a very variety, variety of resources. I have some questions for all papers, but I think we should start from what you ask. To Powell uh, Kamaki, uh, Cretan institutional inscriptions contain uh, two linked parts, the customized uh, IFIS uh, software and the data. The software is under the Apache 2 license, which allows also commercial reuse. The data set has been initially released under a CC by NCSA uh, license, as it is, was the outcome of a research funded by public institution, but we don't exclude the transforming it into a license, so also for commercial use in the future. Okay. This is uh, not a really uh, question, at least there are more Sorry. questions. Was my answer to Powell yes. uh, not, not, uh, not a question? So I was answering to Powell okay. with this. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. So, that's, so are there more questions? I have some questions for all papers, but I think we should start from what you ask. There is a question from uh, Lars, please. Yeah, okay, yes. So no, I was I was a bit puzzled by the answer to Pavel's question because why does the fact that a public institution funded the research or the resources prevent a commercial license? I mean, I, I usually think that companies pay taxes too, which fund public institutions. So why should they be excluded? This but but this this might I this might might be different, but I, I was wondering about that particular uh, aspect of the answer. Well, would you like to answer? Well, I, I was just interested in it because uh, according to uh, 
most definitions of open access, um, non-commercial requirement does not, I mean, a, a license is not open, so it's not open access if, uh, if uh, the license contains a non-commercial requirement because open means reusable by anyone for any purpose. And so I was interested why, um, if you are in the this as open as possible uh, uh, optic, as, as many of us, why did you choose a non-commercial uh, license? Uh, perhaps you were obliged to do so, and why? Uh, this is the rationale behind my question, and the comment that I can make to the answer is uh, almost exactly the same as the one made by Lars. Uh, I don't see why uh, public funding would mean uh, non-commercial only for uh, the, the, the results, but uh, well, perhaps th there is something that we do not understand. And uh, sorry, perhaps for discussing uh, licensing in, in, in a session that is not about licensing, but I see that I am perhaps not the only one who would like to know. Uh, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much for this question. And I think uh, this is uh, in a certain way linked to the uh, discussion that we have this morning about uh, uh, Italian um, not so open license, licensing in uh, uh, universities and public uh, institutions like uh, museums and for also for publishing photographs and other materials. So uh, I totally agree that a non-commercial, no sorry, that a commercial licensing is more open and by heart I would have chosen this and so it's not a uh, choice made because I thought that it was preferable uh, but still in Italy uh, there is a kind of a conception that uh, um, publishing uh, open data uh, as a non-commercial is more open or more tolerable in certain contexts like uh, for the outcomes of research founded by public universities and other public institutions uh, and this is not something that is uh, strictly regulated by uh, PhD uh, laws or things like that, but um, we prefer doing this because it was more um, aligned with, with what uh, university expects uh, for um, outcomes of PhD. But uh, we think that perhaps for a second release, we are considering also uh, the option of uh, moving to a more open license so this i think were the reasons uh, well this is my interpretation of the reasons but uh, if the other uh, co-authors want to intervene on this um uh, they can only say in denmark is in the case uh, the some uh, uh, private company uses the same data you don't want to compete with uh, the money from the public so if a museum uh, earns money from this uh, uh, material, that would be a problem. But yeah, I think I uh, are there questions to the other papers. Otherwise, I, I have one to the first paper on Latin. Uh, it's whether they you use different tools uh, given that Latin uh, develops in uh, a lot of years. Uh, the majority of the Corpora are about classical Latin, but it's not so for uh, everything because the uh, to, uh, English Domesticus is medieval. Uh, Eva Latin uh, contains data of different genres at different periods because, again, we have uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, uh, but main uh, um, about uh, classical Latin. Um, for example, in the Latin affectus, that is uh, the polarity lexicon, we uh, tried to avoid uh, uh, words that uh, were ambiguous for the chronical reasons. So uh, our annotators uh, had um, insert, included only words uh, with a clear polarity that, that didn't change too much uh, among uh, different periods. Okay, thanks. Then to the third paper, because the second paper received uh, uh, questions. Uh, I was wondering uh, for the Icelandic uh, inappropriate words, uh, your uh, example, I think uh, for all professions, I could think of uh, negative uh, uses of the word. Where do you stop? So yeah, where do we stop? Where is the limit? Uh, because uh, 
nearly every profession can be used negatively, or many professions. So, uh, so we basically, uh, it's yeah, it was mostly based on our uh, intuition towards these words, and we mostly used words that have been. Uh, there has been a discussion about these words uh, in our community. So, like, uh, like the example I took with Fostra, uh, which is for uh, the, uh, well, a preschool teacher. Uh, this has been discussed in our community. Uh, so it's corpus based uh, a little bit. Not really corpus based, but more just of the the general discussion in in our. Uh, in the country, <laughs> in our society. So, uh, yeah, we mostly for profession names, we just uh, used uh, words uh, that have been talked about as like some, the people of the profession have uh, mentioned that these words shouldn't be used and they prefer another name instead. Does that answer the question? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks. I just wondered, so the other, uh, question to uh, the Icelandic corpus, the second language. I was wondering whether some of the first results you get are comparable to what you find for English. Um, I actually haven't looked into that, so I cannot uh, say you know, what, uh, what type of results were in English. But I imagine that the, the grammar related errors are usually more prominent with uh, with learners than other types in any language, because this is just, uh, there is a very clear uh, differentiation between the different uh, errors that occur as the levels are advancing. So, which, you know, in theory, it should be uh, for every, every second language learned, so. Okay, thanks. There is the Swedish second language, maybe a possibility to compare the results, so thanks. And then I had a paper uh, and I, a question to the Swedish word matrix. I was uh, wondering whether your research uh, is kept sure when uh, new words are included in the, in the language uh, or is it just a static resource? Yeah, so... Um... Uh, it, it, it contains sort of a this uh, as I mentioned the AFC list. It's a it's a word list with eight hundred thousand words, and uh, uh, in, if you if you don't do anything, you just add a, a new word that you want to calculate the word matrix for. Uh, it uses this base resource, but you can actually choose to also include the words that uh, you add uh, when you want to do your uh, calculations. So. Uh, uh, you can actually choose both, but uh, the words you, that you add will not be added into the permanent resource. It, it, it'll just be added to the calculation that runs uh, that particular time. So, uh, and uh, we don't plan to uh, to update this AFC list, um, uh, but instead treat it as a permanent resource. Uh, but you know, if if we if we're going to update it, it's going to be. Uh, some work and uh, we we simply don't plan to do that right now so, so to be funded probably yeah yeah <laughs> it's a question to the swedish covid-19 corpus uh, i wanted to ask it to dimitrius so whether he has begun looking at whether different media different newspapers treated uh, the Swedish COVID-19 uh, restriction or not restriction in Sweden in different ways. Yeah, no, no, I haven't done that, but it's something that we definitely thought about, and, and not only this in general, but also specific questions about the, the pandemic, like, as I mentioned very briefly, like how um, people uh, talked about the, the elderly, particularly in the beginning, there was a lot of negativity in certain um, uh, blogs and sites uh, about uh, the elderly, which changed uh, uh, during the course of the time. The same, the same with the vaccination. That uh, it goes a little bit up and down uh, about how people feel and wh how what what is the sentiment with respect to vaccination uh, in general. So 
but I haven't, we haven't, I haven't done at least yet, but it's something that I plan to use to, to see if different media use, for example, different vocabulary or, or for specific questions, they, the, 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 the sentiment is different, for example, or, or, or things like that. So, yeah. So my, my answer to you is, yeah, <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Thanks, because uh, it's interesting. <laughs> Thank so uh, the last question I had to the voices uh, from Ravensbrück. Uh, you said, uh, Sylvia, that it's interesting because it's women, so it's gender. Are you, do you have similar uh, data for uh, archives for a male that were uh, in the same conditions so, so that you can compare the gender aspect? This is a very, uh, uh, Costanza, this is a very interesting question and maybe could be the step two of the project because now we are looking for the very same type of interviews from female speakers. Ravensbrück camp was a female camp. So we are trying to find the same artifact, let's say, more or less, in different languages in the same with the, with respect to the same context historical context and uh, uh, life stories so we, we they are made uh, such archives are made of oral uh, life stories of trauma events okay the second step could be find similar objects uh, uttered by male speakers, but uh, this could be a huge research project with the help of all, of all declaring communities, I, I believe, because we, we, we are now facing several difficulties in accessing to what already uh, uh, is, uh, exists with respect to the Ravensbrück story. So um, for the future, I think, yes, I, I would like to do something like that. But uh, I think that we will need more time to, to achieve this, the goal that you have in mind, that is to say, to, to compare from a linguistic perspective, the- And the uh, cultural. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know, oh. yeah. 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 The way in which they, they recall, they, they reiterate the experience. Yes. We suppose, we, we may suppose that they, they will be very, very different. But now we could do for the future. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. I can see Agnes has answered to the question from Leon. So you all can read about the use of uh, uh, taboo in the newspaper. Then I have a last question to the written institutional description, so the second paper, you use the pictures in your, uh, in your uh, databases. Uh, and I was wondering whether you have thought about using a 3D pictures, because I think when you use frag this data of uh, inscriptions on uh, uh, on a stone, uh, the physicality also means something. Yes, well, a lot of a lot of more wonderful things could have been made for uh, with the material I worked on, but my main problem was time. And in three years, I both to uh, carry on with the markup of the text and doing the initial uh, planned research. So I have so many regrets of things that I had not time to do, including uh, dealing with images, uh, which are not present uh, at all, um, unfortunately. And also the other things could have been done with the, um, the, the geographical presentation of the fine spots of the mentioned places, uh, 
and at this stage, you know, the, we, we don't have any of those things. So we have the edition of the text with the links to other uh, resources available online, but uh, uh, not images, uh, not even translations, which <laughs> it's really a pity because all, all um, modern uh, digital editions of inscriptions have, but it would have been huge. But I still have the hope to, to be able to do some more in the future or anyone who else who would like to carry on this work could just use the text and uh, do something more with them. I can see last question by Leon to uh, Agnes, whether she has been in contact with this newspaper to get some no. feedback. Uh, so uh, I have not been personally in contact with them, but my colleague uh, is in close collaboration with uh, uh, the newspaper and it's uh, just in general, the the uh, correcting uh, program or the what's it called the correcting tool? Yeah, the spell and grammar checker. Uh, yeah, so yeah, my colleague is in close co collaboration with the paper, but we haven't gotten any specific uh, feedback on the taboo words per se. But they are part of this uh, spell checker uh, that they use. So yeah. <laughs> so I have to conclude our session. Thank you to all of you. It was an honor to hear about your resources. And thank you for keeping the time, <laughs> all of you. So thanks.